Okay, so in the last video, we've looked more in depth into what particles are and how you can have them as a both wave and a particle. And so in this video, we'll expand on it by explaining the mathematical theory underpinning it a little bit more in depth, explaining the basics of mathematics of the wave function and even building up to this scary looking integral at the end. But first, we need to start the function behind the video. So what is a wave function? Well, wave function is most of all a concept we made up to describe particles. How? Well, in classical mechanics, you can specify the state of a system using just the position and momentum. Meaning that if you have a point ball, you can specify its mechanics exactly if you get the exact position and the exact momentum. That's simple enough. In quantum mechanics, however, due to reasons, you can't use these two values to describe them, and thus what we actually use to describe the particles is the wave function. This wave function is a function that takes in the position and just tells you stuff about it. What stuff? Well, for example, if you take this wave function and if you square the absolute value, then you get something that's proportional to the probability of the particle being in any given spot. So right here, it's really likely that the particle is there. Right here, not likely. And right here, borderline impossible. Neat. You can also perform some mathematical witchcraft on it and get back the momentum. Now, if you do the same thing, you can get the probability of the momentum, which, well, if you think about it for a second, it won't really make any sense, but if you think about it for two seconds, it should make some sense. And there. Uh, that way you can get a position and momentum of a particle in quantum mechanics. Now, with that in mind, there is a reasonable question to be asked here. What is that function exactly? Because so far you might have realized I've been telling you what you can do with the function without actually defining it, which is a pretty major red flag and a sign that you should probably give up drinking and stop being an alcoholic. I mean a physicist, whoops, I meant a physicist. Nah, whatever, what's the difference anyway? Well, first of all, it's a complex wave. That much is simple enough. It's complex because it makes the math a bit smoother. And it's a wave because, if you remember from the previous videos, particles have this really nasty habit of forgetting that they're particles sometimes and just thinking they're a wave. So now we know what it's made for, what it'll be used for, and what it will look like. But how is it defined? Well, it's defined with... Okay, this is a lot more tricky than it seems, so just think about it this way. You have the Schrodinger's equation, which kind of defines like the rules of change, basically. So it states that the change of the particle is equal to the kinetic energy plus the potential energy of the particle. Which means that if your function does not follow these rules, then it's not following the rules of physics. And therefore, it's not a real particle. Which means that out of all possible mathematical functions, there is only a certain infinite amount of wave functions that actually follow our laws of physics. And those are the ones that we will actually be working with. Whenever you see a psi, this just means the information about the particle in our universe. Okay, that's cool, but which one out of these infinities are we looking for? Well, this one is a bit of a pickle to answer, and instead I'll just leave it for the next video and oversimplify for now to say that there is a way that we can combine them into a single wave function. And there. That was the wave function fully explained. With no problems, no worries, and now I can just leave this behind and move on to more the fun stuff, like, I don't know, maybe some computer science, so real-life chemistry, science research, you know, all this. Wait. The video isn't over. Wait, was that explanation? Oh, you want an actual example? Oh, I see. So let's start with a wave function like this. What do all of these mean? Well, that simple. I'll represent it using a graph. So basically, the wave is equal to what would be the height. The higher the result, the higher the height. The less high the result, the less higher the height. The next x is just the left and the right. The more right it goes, the higher the x. The more left it goes, the lower the x, like so. So there. That's the wave with just the x. Next, there is the t. We subtract it from x because it's time, and so this is what looks like once it starts going up. It's time. But I'll pause it for now, because we don't really have a budget for render times this large. Anyway, then there is the wave number and the frequency. Here's how the wave number modifies the wave, and here's how the frequency modifies the wave. Simple. Then there is phase. I'll pause the time again for this, and now you can see that it moves the function. 
And the last one, amplitude, which just amplifies the wave function, and there, that's all the constants. So this is like the basic blueprint for a wave, but it is useful to remember that our actual wave function would be a bit more complex. Uh, literally. That's because we get both the real and imaginary numbers in our wave. So a better description would be the Euler's formula, which, as it just so happened, I've explained before, and so I won't dwell on it too much. The basic idea is, this is the Euler's formula, and it describes the screw on the convex plane, which may seem unrelated from our wave, until you realize that from both sides, it just looks like a wave. And so there, that's the TLDR. What we end up with is the mathematical wave. But in this video, we won't really deal with mathematical waves, only physical waves. What's the difference between them? Well, basically this meme. Okay, hear me out. Basically, this is a cosine wave. This is just wave going as far left and as far right as possible. It spans over all real numbers because that's how cosine works in mathematics. But that's not really what we'd want from our physical waves. That's because if you have a light wave, for example, then it's not really spanning the entire universe, only it's localized. But there is an interesting question to be asked here. You see, we can expand our wave or we can make it smaller, but how small can we make it? Like this, is this still a wave? What about this? Or this? Or, okay, now this is definitely not a wave, right? Well, here's where we kind of expand our concept of what makes a wave. That's because a wave is more like a way of analyzing things rather than the thing itself. And okay, I know it doesn't make all that much sense, so let me explain. Take a look at this wave function. As you can see, we have a clear wave number which we can measure and just figure out. Except there's a pickle. This measurement of a wave number is not as clear as it seems. That's because here you have a cosine of a wave number of 2, Here's a wave number of 1.98, and here's wave number 2.02. You can see that these are all different, and yet they kind of fit. And what's more, some of them fit better than others, so how do we describe it? Well, fortunately, in the past, in my most popular video on the channel, I've showcased a tool called the Fourier Transform. But considering how I haven't really got 40 minutes on hand right now, I'll just steal the it and say that the Fourier Transform tells you how well a function correlates with a wave function of a certain frequency. So right here you can see that the cosine with a wave number of 2 is the best fit, but other wave numbers still kind of work. Okay, but why should we care? Like, yeah, sure, it's a cool way to describe the wave numbers, but why would we do it this way instead of just measuring it? I mean, the maximum of the peaks should tell us the wave number, so why do we need the big scary integral? Well, that's because our integral is extremely general, and with that transform, you don't even need the multiple peaks or anything to measure the wavelength. Now you can see that as our wave gets more and more localized, we are more and more uncertain about the wavelength, which, I mean, it makes sense. Look at this wave. You know where the wave is, it's right here. But what about the wavelength? Well, if you had to guess its wavelength, it would be a challenge, because there aren't even any peaks, and as such, the Fourier transform is very delocalized. If we delocalize the wave, however, then we get a bunch of peaks, and so now we can figure out what the wave number is exactly. You can see that the Fourier gives us a much more specific answer. But the wave itself is all over the place, and so you wouldn't really know exactly where it is. And so, just as a recap, here's how we can think about it. This blue line is our wave function, because it's a function that's a wave. And when it comes to our orange line, you can think of it as how much our wave corresponds with a wave of a certain wave number. So here I'm going to go over a bunch of different waves with different wave numbers. And right here you can see that the closer it is to the peak, the more it aligns. And so you can see that if we change the wave, change the wave number. And so you can see that if I change the wave, change the wave number, then how much all of these waves fit changes. So while we're here, might as well describe this property. We can say that the more delocalized our wave function, the more uncertain we are about its wavelength. The less uncertain we are about the wavelength, the less localized the wave. And so just add that to the list of foreshadowings. Okay, and now that we've got feel of the waves, let's give it a tad more physical, but just a tad. First things first, our wave function gives us a complex number, and for the sake of making things easier for ourselves, let's turn it into a positive real number. How? Well, if you've got a complex number and you want to get a positive real number, then just squaring it won't do you any good. 
If you square it, what you'll end up with is a positive number, two imaginary numbers, and a negative number because i times i equals negative 1 and b squared is positive. So instead, a much better way to do it would be to multiply it by its complex conjugate. Complex conjugate just means that we flip the imaginary part. And now if we multiply them out step by step, first cancelling the ib and negative ib, and then getting the a squared, which is already a positive number, and then minus ib squared, where i squared is just equal to negative 1, and negative negative 1 is just a positive 1, meaning that we get a squared number plus the squared number. Or in other words, a positive real number. And if you've seen my previous video about Hilbert spaces, then add that to the list of foreshadowings. And so if we start with our complex wave, we can multiply it by a complex conjugate and get a positive real number. And this is where all of the hard work in this video really pays off, because here's where we can start interpreting our results. So, this entire time I've been saying that the wave function describes the state of a system. But how? Well, as it just so happens, this wave function multiplied by its complex conjugate gives you the probability density of the particle being in any given spot. So take a look at this equation. Remember it? That's the equation from the beginning of the video. Now we can get to what it means, because this just means the probability density of our particle being in any given spot, and this means the area under that function between A and B. So if you have a wave function, which after multiplying it by complex conjugate gives you a curve like this, then the integral between a and b would be this area. And now this area, if it's been properly normalized, gives us the probability of the particle being in between these two spots. And this is huge. So for example, if this wave function was for a one-dimensional electron, then if this area right here between a and b would be equal to half of the total area, then we would have a 50% chance to find the electron there. And so it certainly took us a while, but we finally got here. Remember how in the last video I've used this cube as an example in classical mechanics? When in classical mechanics you describe the position of any object with a point, so you know, x, y, z. In quantum mechanics, however, you can't do that because it's probabilistic. And so instead what you need to do is use this integral to figure out where the particle is most likely to be. But what about momentum? Well, on the beginning of this video, I've mentioned how... Well, in classical mechanics, you can specify the state of a system using just the position and momentum. Meaning that if you have a point... But in quantum mechanics, you've got waves. And so it is worth asking, what is momentum in quantum mechanics? Because it won't be just a simple mass times velocity. Light doesn't have mass, but it has momentum. And so as such, the quantum mechanical momentum will actually be... P equals h bar k, where k is the wave number. But here's the big reveal. Remember the Fourier transform from before, the one where we got the wave number based on the wave function? Well, this relation is actually going a bit deeper than you think. And basically, you can have two kinds of wave functions, the position and the momentum. And you can actually switch between them using the Fourier transform, which means that whilst in classical mechanics, you have the position and momentum, in quantum, you have the wave function, and that's it. But there is more! Remember the foreshadowing of the Fourier transform and the wave function? Well, we could rewrite it a bit and say that the uncertainty of position multiplied by uncertainty of momentum is always greater or equal to something, which means that no matter how much you specify one of them, the other gets more and more uncertain to compensate, which is the wave relation we've seen before otherwise known as the uncertainty principle. By wait, there is more. Remember the foreshadowing of the Hilbert spaces? Well, this is actually where we get into this notation and... Oh, was that? Oh, I ran out of time to make this video. Uh... Whoops. And so I suppose, unfortunately, we'll have to pick it up next time. For now, I'd like to thank my patrons, especially Acronymous, Useless, Quasa, and Legref, supporting me the highest patron tier. And as always, I stream every single day for charity. I have a Discord server. And for now, that'll be it. Thank you everyone so much for watching and have a great day. Bye.